We are anxious to speak. We will be, after the presentations and the acceptance of minutes, we'll head to the public comment session. And most of the speakers are about both subjects anyway. Could I ask a question before we start? Sure. Um, do we have, uh, are we voting on something tonight for the information of those who are here, and the presenters, or uh, is this just informational, or what is our objective? On the Parrot Avenue? Uh, no, no, on the, on the oh, Copley Landfill. There's, there's no action to be, th no, on the, there's no action on the agenda. This is something that was brought up, um, at the, I believe, the meeting right before Christmas. We had several speakers. Uh, and then we, we asked for a report because, yeah, I have to confess, I, I don't know as much about the Coca Info Group as, as I as I will after tonight. And I think that was the we simply asked for a presentation as a kind of moving this forward to see if anything comes in the future, because I think there was some there was some informal requests for providing water relief to other to other communities. So we would have to put that on, on an, a future agenda if we deal with that. Yes, okay. yes, absolutely. Yeah, there is no action tonight on the cochlear. We simply, this is a, another learning experience. And that's correct, Your Honor. This is a report back from the cochlear landfill group after a request from the town of Greenland to provide water infrastructure along Breakfast Hill Road had been submitted to the council. Council wanted to know what the cochlear landfill group would have to say about that, and this is the report back. Uh, I am Robert Sullivan. I am here in the dual capacity of being the city attorney for the city of Portsmouth, but also the municipal member of the Coakley Landfill Group, uh, about which you will hear more in a, in a moment or two. Uh, with me is Peter Britz, the city's environmental planner. His role in this that is that uh, as a city employee, he provides administrative support to the Coakley Landfill Group, and the group uh, reimburses the city for his expenses in doing that work. And uh, with us both is Michael Daling. Michael Daling is an engineer from Lewiston, Maine, the company of CES Inc. He is a hydrogeologist. Uh, and he has been a licensed hydrogeologist in Maine uh, and New Hampshire for 25 years. And uh, very significantly, he has been working on Superfund sites. And the Coakley Landfill is a federal Superfund site for 25 years. And the importance of that is that Superfund sites have only existed for about that length of time. Uh, Superfund was created by a federal law uh, at that time. Coakley Landfill is one of the first Superfund sites. And uh, hydrogeologist, uh, Mr. Daling, has been working on Superfund sites for the entire period of time that they have existed. Uh, the our purpose here tonight is, uh, as just stated a minute ago in response to the assistant mayor's question, is to provide the city council with input from the Coakley Landfill group about um, uh, what the group knows about such things as the hydrogeology around the site, uh, where the water's going uh, underground, um, contamination that might be uh, in that water, moving underground or not moving underground. And our basis in providing this report to the city council is uh, very significant. The, um, the site itself, the remediation, was constructed after, as I recall, about $13 million. And in environmental studies, primarily hydrogeologic, and, uh, and construction-related activities under the careful supervision of uh, the Environmental Protection Agency and the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services um, to remediate the site from problems that were, were, were found there in the mid-1980s. Um, you will hear much more detail about these things from uh, Mr. Daling. Uh, briefly, that site was a gravel mining operation uh, owned by the Coakley family. Uh, and when the gravel was depleted in the early 1970s, as was sort of common at the time, 
in searching for another use of the property. Um, some arrangement uh, was entered between the Coakley, the city of Portsmouth, and others to allow that empty gravel pit to be used as a, uh, a uh, for the placement of municipal refuse. Um, for a period of probably about 13 years, all the municipal refuse from Portsmouth, from Northampton, from Newington, and from the residential portion of Pease Air Force Base uh, went to the site. It was uh, brought out there in trucks, dumped, and covered over. And uh, in the early 1980s, the city uh, moved away from Coakley and went to a, a refuse drainage facility on the air base in which municipal refuse from Portsmouth was, was actually incinerated, turned into steam, and steam was used to heat Pease Air Force Base. Um, the fly ash left over from that process also went to the Coakley landfill. Um, now, <clears throat> when, the problems, when problems were discovered in the 1980s, mid-1980s, Coakley became one of the first federal Superfund sites in the country under this new law, um, which although it was named the Superfund law, did not actually carry with it any Superfund. Uh, the way the Superfund works is that money is raised from parties who participated in whatever it is that became the Superfund site. In this case, uh, very significantly, the municipalities that I mentioned, as well as numerous private entities and, uh, and waste haulers would be the three main groups. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, at a cost of about $13 million, a remediation was designed, and others can do this better than me, but basically what the remediation is is all of the refuse was pulled together from various parts of the 25-acre site and raised up by means of uh, heavy equipment so that it will be above the water table. And then all the refuse was covered over with a multimedia seven-layer cap designed primarily to prevent uh, rainwater from filtering through the refuse and, and spreading its contents. Uh, it's like a roof over this pile of waste material. And, <clears throat> and as, as I say, it's a seven-layer roof. It's a pretty complicated one. But it was all designed to prevent uh, uh, contamination from landfill from spreading anywhere. Uh, you will hear more about this in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> we now have 25 years <clears throat> of information uh, which we have gathered concerning what comes out of that landfill uh, and where it goes. Uh, this information was gathered through a process mandated by the EPA and the DES, the regulatory agencies, which involves extensive sampling. We've had up to 60 wells, which we will show you in a minute, uh, 60 monitoring wells to determine what's happening, and, uh, and constant sampling for the entire 25-year period. We have a lot of information. Mr. Daling will, will outline that to you as much as can be done in the time that is available. Um, <clears throat> A little about the Coakley Landfill Group. Uh, the regulatory agencies uh, compel their instructions to be followed by means of consent decrees. There are two at the Coakley Landfill. And the consent decrees are agreements between the agencies and the parties responsible for the landfill, which indicate uh, the process that will be followed to design a remediation, the construction of the remediation, and then the operation of that remediation after the construction. And uh, the consent decrees are uh, powerful documents enforced with the power of the federal courts. And uh, the way that the parties to the Coakley landfill, the municipalities, the transporters of waste, generators of waste, um, the way they implement uh, their obligations under the consent decrees, two, one for the cap itself, that's called operable unit one, the cap and anything under the cap, and then one for operable unit two, so-called, 
which is basically anything other than what's under the cap, out to the edges, migration of uh, groundwater, for example, would be OU2. Uh, the way the parties who entered these consent decrees with the federal government uh, implement uh, the consent decrees is through the establishment of the Coakley Landfill Group. The group consisted initially, initially of everyone who signed a consent decree with the regulatory agencies. Um, the, all of those parties then entered amongst themselves, something called participating party agreements. And under the participating party agreements, all of those parties created a three-member executive committee. And uh, the executive committee consists of a municipal member, which has been me for the entire period that the Gokie Landfill Group has existed, um, a Boston attorney named Seth Jaffe from Foley, Hoag, and Elliott, who represents the, the generator group and he has been a member of the Coker Landfill Group for the entire time that the group has existed. And then thirdly at the moment is a, an individual named Curtis Shipley, a lawyer I believe as well, who represents the transporters. Uh, at one time it was waste management. And, the, uh, and he uh, is I believe in South Carolina. The way the group operates is that approximately once a month we have a teleconference at which the business of the group is carried out by means of operation of the executive committee. And uh, <clears throat> the executive committee um, enters contracts with uh, individuals to do work. We actually built by means of contracts with construction companies, the entire remediation. And also contracts to conduct the monitoring that needs to be constantly monitored. Uh, we hire engineers. I heard Mr. Daling. Um, the group, uh, the executive committee of the group has basically done everything that needs to be done for the entire 25 year period. Um, <clears throat> the, the goal now, the assignment of the Coakley Landfill Group and the executive committee is very clear. The responsibility of the group and the committee is to implement the consent decrees. Uh, not to take other actions that they might find necessary or desirable, but to implement the consent decrees. And that's the legal duty that the executive committee considers every month when it has its uh, teleconference. Uh, <clears throat> an important point I think to be made is about voting power of the executive committee. Uh, executive committee consists of the three members that I listed. But uh, in terms of making decisions, the executive committee operates on a four vote system in which every decision needs to be made by majority vote of the four. And the way you get to the four votes is that the generators have a vote, the transporters have a vote, and the municipalities have two votes. Now, if you think about that for a minute, it means that neither the municipalities nor the generators are transporters or transporters can actually take any independent action. Uh, the municipalities could block generators and transporters. They could block the municipalities. For that reason, the participating parties agreement specifically encourages that the executive committee operate by means of consensus. And I will report to you that for 25 years, the executive committee has always made its decisions based upon consensus, meaning the members uh, discuss issues, make decisions, and much as you would, uh, debate among themselves what's the appropriate action to take to implement consent decrees. And then, <clears throat> in the case of the Coke Executive Committee, it is only when complete agreement is reached by everyone that any action is taken. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Executive Committee pays for things that it does by means of two trust accounts, which are maintained under the participating parties agreements. An OU1 trust account for pay for things on the cap and directly under, and an OU2 trust account to pay for, well, essentially anything else uh, away from the cap. Uh, I know there is some interest in how much money uh, the Coke the Landfill Group has 
and at the most recent accounting, which was last month, uh, the, the OU1 trust account uh, kept in Piscataqua Bank uh, contained $68,856.71, and the OU2 trust account also kept Piscataqua Bank uh, contained $210,000. $879.15. The executive committee uses the, those funds to pay for the operations of the group, um, as I've been describing to you uh, thus far. Uh, when more money is needed, the executive committee determines how much is needed, and typically we make this decision on a yearly basis, how much we'll, we expect we're going to spend over the upcoming year, and then the group raises those funds by means of assessments, uh, which are sent out to the, to the various groups. Um, the, municipal, the municipal assessments are sent directly to the affected municipalities. Um, in the generator and transporter cases, uh, the assessments just go to subgroups that they have, um, to which the municipalities have very little involvement, and the subgroup uh, as a chair, and in the case of the transporters, for example, it's that attorney Jaffe in Boston. We send the assessment to him, and through some device of his own, he raises that money from his transporters, and uh, we have no involvement, as I say, in how that happens. Similarly with the uh, transporters, same, same thing. We send it to Mr. Curtis, and he raises, or Mr. Shipley, and he raises the funds. So that's the way that the group raises uh, money. Uh, Portsmouth has actually funded its share um, decades ago by means of uh, <coughs> authorizing a bond issuance. And the Portsmouth money comes from uh, the bond approved by some city council, eight or nine city councils back. Um, with <coughs> With that as, uh, as my introduction and explanation of the group and how it works, I'd like to ask Mr. Daling uh, to come here. He is going to describe to you in some detail using PowerPoint um, what we know about the hydrogeology around the Coakley landfill and uh, what we know about what is in the water in that hydrogeology. Thank you. 